Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Steve Siwak. Steve is an entertainment engineer and also a professional engineer and also um, was an aerospace engineer for a bit uh, with Grumman. Go. And I think you were a NASA contractor. I, I, when I was at Grumman, uh, NASA was uh, a client quite a lot. I also was at uh, the Ralph Fairchild nice. for a couple of years. Sorry and- about that. And I, I pretty much, well, so far, we'll see what happens next. But I've bookended my aerospace career with a company called Aeroflex. Nice. Aeroflex was my the first company I worked at out of college. And also the last aerospace company I worked at. The first one was in Plainview. The last version of Aeroflex was in Hop Hog. Though between 1983 and 2000 and uh, what was it, uh, 2018, roughly? Um, they were bought out by a British company. Interesting. Is that a but, common fate for like an American aerospace company, or is that? I, I don't know. There was there was all. The, oh, I'm trying to think of the acronym for it. That you all the hoops you have to jump through because you're a non-American owned. I would think ITAR. Yeah, ITAR. Stuff. Yeah. It was just another layer. It was. It was not a problem, just a layer of annoyance to have to, you know, just double, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's a little bit more aggressively. ITAR is uh, quite a pain in the rear. I have to work with that uh, at Form Logic now. And then there was another place I was at at one point where my sister-in-law came in and they said, are you a U.S. citizen? Because I was giving her and my brother a tour. And I won't say what place, <laughs> but... Um... <laughs> She goes, yes. And I, you know, I believed her and all this stuff. And then she got on the floor and they'd let her in and she goes, I'm actually an Australian citizen. I'm like, I don't want to know that. (laughs) (laughs) You made it in. You were fine. (laughs) Exactly. Don't tell me. (laughs) Oh man. You you, you need to be around people you can do crimes with. Yeah. I think, I mean, I just was totally ignorant to it until she told me. If I'd have gone my whole career without knowing that, I mean, I could have just said, yeah, you know, totally compliant. <laughs> take, take, take the, uh, take, take the, uh, lie detector test and you'll pass. Yeah. Yeah. She said she was an American citizen. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think, so doesn't that test for, I think it's stress, right? So yeah, I guess if you were like under threat of going to Leavenworth for like an ITAR violation, you know, like. A huge number of years if ago. If you're a sociopath, you can pass the lie detector test. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I completely if, agree. If you, if you believe your own bullshit, you can also pass the lie detector. Pathological lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would work too. Or if you just don't care about the consequences, I would assume you can pass the right. lie detector test. Yeah. Or you can for I imagine, not that I've ever done a lie detector test, but I imagine you can fall. You can you can force a false negative. Interesting. You could definitely force a false positive. If you well, a fa- oh, well, yeah, false. A uh, force a false positive, so that when they ask you your name, you give yeah. them your name, but you Spencer, associate Spencer, horrible Spencer. imagery with it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you'd have to. Yeah, you'd want to be like. Uh, you'd want to be nervous and sweaty when you were doing the control questions. Is what I would think. Yeah. Yeah. That way, you just totally invalidate their results and then leave you alone. Yeah. I don't know. I've never had to do one. I did get fingerprinted at work one time um, because we had a weird client that wrote it into the contract. Um, That was interesting. And then I had a coworker at that job who had uh, two over 100 mile an hour speeding tickets that this particular client found out about. And this coworker was very upset about it. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think early on, I think it was Aeroflex the first time around that I, uh, I had to get uh, you know secret level clearance for some of the stuff I was doing. And certainly for Grumman Aerospace, I had to get secret level clearance because we were working on anti-terrorist robots. Interesting. We, so- we took the, the Flight Teller Robotic Servicer, which may be one of our points of conversation tonight. Yeah. And the thought was to take components from the Flight Teller Robotic Servicer and use them on a mobile base to help disarm very tricky improvised explosive devices. Was this during the Iraq War? 
No, this was this was at home. Basically, the the they gave me a copy that had to stay at work, but they gave me a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook, <laughs> the the original. I actually just gave one of my friends uh, a copy of that as a gift. Yeah, well, I, uh, a friend of mine who I will not name said, "Steve, can you make a photocopy <laughs> of the pages that tell me how to make bombs?" That's hilarious. And it's like, um, no. I said, if you'll note, this is one of the reasons why I have a security clearance and you do not, <laughs> because I will not make you a photocopy of the pages that tell you how to make bombs. I had those, I had, I had that in, in uh, high school. I had, I had the online version. And I remember like looking back on it now, a lot of, and I don't know if it was like this with the hardcover too, but a lot of the things they told you to do would get you killed if you actually followed the direction. So it was it was very misleading, I think intentionally so. <laughs> um, it, is, isn't there like a, a whole line of internet nonsense where people tell you to do something incredibly wrong just to see how stupid their audiences are? Evidently, I mean, yeah, that's what that was. Um, like trying to pick up a car with your hand so you can change the tire, just stupid. Obviously. Is that a thing on the internet? What is that a thing on the internet? That's In intentionally stupid directions. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> I've come across them. They typically they they come in meme form, but it's like they're trying to get people hurt and injured. Oh, injured the and anarchist injured. cookbook online version was trying to get people killed. I mean, like if you I, actually... I am not about to put anarchist's cookbook into my search engine. <laughs> ah, you know, you do stupid stuff when you're in high school. <laughs> And, and we also had the government version of the Anarchist's Cookbook. Oh, that would have been, uh, the heck was that called? You know. I forget. It was very boring, though. The Anarchist Cookbook was like, you know, not not that R. Crumb did the illustrations, but they were <laughs> like R. Crumb type of illustrations. That's cool. So it was uh, it was enjoyable. I got to reread that at some point. Uh, it would be interesting. But uh, the thing is, with the government version of the Anarchist's Cookbook, you, you realize that all the triggers, you know, they had page upon page of how to trigger your explosive. And I'm thinking Interesting. For, a, for an explosive trigger to get in the government book means that somebody with the government had to be able to circumvent it, which means only the suckier triggers are in the book. Interesting. The ones blew up because they were not able to circumvent these triggers. The that makes sense triggers. to me. Yeah, that's, that's all they're going to know about. I mean, you would think, I mean, is this all just reverse engineered stuff from like opponents and wars on the government version? Because I would have thought some of it might be just engineers like you and me coming up with stuff work, that worked for the government. Like this is how I, I would I, do it. I, my, my recollection of it is that it wasn't just like, you know, you know, those little books you can buy, you know, a thousand and one interesting inventions. And it's, you know, just invent patent, you know, pictures from patents from the 1920s of anything under a given category <laughs> and people just making stuff up to get it in the book and it's never been tried it's never been proven or and it probably it wouldn't work if you did try it somebody's yeah. hand sketch Napkin <laughs> i got the sense even from the government book that because they had a lot of photographs they had a lot of photographs of uh bomb triggers and i got the sense that they were taken from the real world that makes sense yeah and you know the 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 legit anarchist cookbook, not the government one, just very interesting. And it made me realize that if you're halfway good at what you do, in this case, the category would be being an anarchist, there are very few things that the rest of us, even the smarter ones among us, can do to circumvent the plans of a very smart anarchist. There yeah. are ways to rig a car to explode where you don't even you won't even know the car has been rigged until you've triggered it. That's interesting. It makes sense. I mean And you know I, I remember years ago, you know, reading about with you know Al Qaeda how some of the people, some of the mad bombers were former engineering students. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm thinking they have to be the suckier engineering students <laughs> because A, most of their stuff doesn't work, and B, 
if they were any good at engineering, they'd have real jobs <laughs> and wouldn't have to be working for these morons who are trying to blow stuff up all the time. Yeah, I agree. Um, did you remember when that person tried to set up a bomb? I think it was in Midtown. And it was well, just the suckiest team. bomb ever. It was like the pressure cooker bomb, but it didn't make any mm -hmm. sense. Like, it, what, 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 it was I'm, open I'm, containers. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that, and knock on wood, that the people who apparently get into terrorism as a way of life just aren't the brightest. Yeah, I agree. And only hope it continues along that path. Yeah, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say why that was a bad design, but as an engineer, I was I was kind of laughing a little bit when I saw that news story just because the bomb was so far fetched and like you said just idiotic, and I mean I don't know maybe this hopefully this isn't too distasteful to say but it was it was so bad it was funny to me it was so so poorly engineered yeah yeah but yeah so I I, I never I never did make uh, those photocopies for my friend good <laughs> so you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I see an issue with, with pyrotechnics, hopefully done safely. But, I mean, yeah, you don't want that to fall in the hands of the wrong people, for sure. Yeah. If, if, if you're the only one who's going to get hurt, it's sort of... you sort of Self-selection. Right yeah, well, no, I, I agree with you on that. And um, there is some video of... I can't remember what it was, but it was like somebody with like Tannerite or like a binary explosive where they detonated about 10 feet from the, the camera person. And the camera person is the person uh, narrating it and detonating it. And so that way you're just like, whoa, like what the, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, why would you do that? Uh, I don't know. I think it's, you know, my, my son, when he was younger, would make uh, bombs in the backyard. And then he'd, he'd throw them. We had a whole, we had an, a, a wooded area behind the house where nobody was. So when these things went off, it made quite a lot of noise. So, uh, well, the, the thing is, the, 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 our neighbors up in Cornwall, at first we all got along very well. And then for whatever reason, we didn't. They called the police. <laughs> I'm Greg. And the, the no. one officer came by. He didn't have any backup or anything. And he, he came to us and he told us the situation. And um, I forget how he found out. I think he walked into the backyard and he saw some of the empty water bottles and the <laughs> running alcohol and whatever. Probably dead grass around them too, and I would assume. He, he basically, you know, we, we got a laugh over the fact that, no, the neighbors had reported that Greg was firing a gun, which he was not since we don't own any guns. That makes sense. I didn't back then. Um, so he said, yeah, well, you should just stop. And so Greg stopped. And as we're all walking back to the front of the house, the officer, the police officer said, you know, if you use <laughs> then it will catch fire when it explodes. <laughs> and he goes, and you, and he said to my son, he said, you know how to make homemade napalm, right? And it's like... It's an Atticus cookbook original. We, we said, yeah. And he, he goes on to explain how to make homemade napalm. And it's not officially napalm with the with the copyright it's, or the trademark. The styrene you know what version talking you're talking about. And I, yeah. I tell this police officer, I said, will you please stop giving my son bad ideas <laughs> on how to basically get in trouble with the police. <laughs> we might not be so lucky next time. <laughs> yeah, and, that makes and sense. Greg said, yeah, he goes, later on after the cop went home, he goes, oh my God, that cop. He goes, he's trying to like suck up to all the kids to be the cool cops that will all go to him if we have problems. I said, but please do not make anything <laughs> he said Hey, this is how you make it. And Greg says, don't worry, I won't. That's hilarious. But, but we, we did make a six foot long potato gun. <laughs> you told me about that one. And, uh, and that, that was great, especially when uh, when the police came by and you know Greg was there, obviously, and a bunch of his friends were there. And it was two it was 1:30 in the morning, which was really stupid on our part. There was no doubting we were a bunch of idiots. 
And so the cop hears all these retorts from him back of the house. <laughs> and he comes back and Greg's friends grabbed the potato gun and ran off into the woods. <laughs> Af the aforementioned woods. And the cop comes and he goes, what are you guys doing? It's 1.30 in the morning. He goes, are you lighting fireworks? I said, yeah, we are. I apologize. And he goes, okay, just, just stop. Meanwhile, on the lawn surrounding <laughs> us are like a dozen cored out potatoes. Nice. That had been our ammunition for the six foot long potato gun. So you did the thing where you filed the edges to, to make the potatoes I thought cut. I had invented that. You're telling me this is common knowledge? <laughs> I mean, only if you were a hooligan kid that made things like that growing up, like, like I yeah, was. <laughs> no, we, 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 we did a bevel cut to the, ed to the leading edge uh, on the outside circumference. And then we had a stick with a piece of you know, gaffer's tape or something on it so we know how to plunge it into the right amount. <laughs> We had a little electric sparking trigger that we bought for ten bucks from like a like a barbecue. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I got a funny story about one of those too. Idea. What? I got a funny story about one of those too. My brother's friend. <laughs> this is. It's not. It's a little bit morbidly funny. So, my brother's friend um, had to be medevaced because he shot himself in the eye with a potato, and so I had done some things like that. In, in my childhood, and when I was hearing this story, um, what I was told is that it just went off when he was inspecting it, you know, and I said, there's no way it would do that. You had to click the, the barbecue ignition to get it to do that, because those things don't just spontaneously send a spark. And my brother and his friend, who now has an injured eye, both go, shut the fuck up, you know, like... <laughs> Because my parents had bought it. <laughs> so... oh. <laughs> no, we, we, Which it still we, is we, stupid to look down the barrel of a loaded weapon, like regardless. Yeah, that, yeah. That's what I was about to say. You don't want to do that. Yeah. But he was looking and clicking the, the igniter like like the biggest idiot, you know. And so it was like I don't want to say he deserved it, but you know it was... hopefully he learned his lesson. For sure. He must have, right? I mean, there's no way you survive something like that. You don't get a little bit traumatized in a way that's going to keep you from doing yeah. it again. So, yeah. But, okay, so there's another one we used to do where we would take it was, it was a very similar thing, I think. And so you would, you would put and um, then you would put it either in the grass or in a dumpster and it would explode and make a really loud noise. And if it was on the grass, it would kill all the grass around it. <laughs> I mean, there was maybe like, I want to say like a 30 second delay, and then it would just start making this, I think it was chlorine gas. <laughs> like, I want to, I, I, I'm not, Great. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, at, uh, at Grumman, they gave me that the anarchist cookbook and the government's version. Uh, because we were taking, the, I think it was mostly the arm from the flight teller robotic servicer, and they wanted to stick it on a mobile base. What did the flight teller robotic servicer do? Just to kind of the flight teller robotic servicer was, jeez, oh, what year was that? Eighty six, mid eighties, mid to late eighties, and I can shoot you pictures, Nick. Yeah, camera. that'd be awesome. Your 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 episodes are always the most expensive to edit, but also the best edited. I, so I, I will not say no. I, I was I was watching the last one, and you guys um, you guys did beautiful cutaways, like thank to you the, uh, to the trailer for Thanks, Final Carl. Destination. Say again. I, I was watching that, and it was it was hilarious because every this was back in the day where if you wanted to do car stunts, you needed to use real cars. <laughs> You couldn't do all computer graphics cars like you know in in your in your base in the Fast and the Furious Nine or whatever they're up to now. Yeah, or they're dropping them from orbit and whatever the hell yeah, else. It's they're ridiculous doing. shit. Well, so, I mean, they're not actually. It's all CGI nonsense. Yeah. So if you if you look at the cars that are flipping in that crazy sequence in Final Destination with the logs, yeah, that was a really good editing job you, on you Carl's part. You can see there's there are steel tubes under steel pipe segments underneath the car. Oh, you can see that in there. 
So they had rounds oh my to God, shoot them up. It's so obvious. You can see these big steel pipes. And what they do is they <laughs> stick a segment of a log in an explosive charge. And they <laughs> blow the log out like it's a cannon. And that flips the car in the other direction. That's amazing. You can, you can see the chassis have been massive, been massively reinforced by <laughs> roughly two inch square steel tubes. You think how many takes did they do? Like they must have only gotten one take, right? Like it must have yeah, been so yeah. expensive. Yeah, unless you unless you get a lot of used cars. <laughs> well, Blues Brothers, as you know, has a Guinness World Record for most police cars destroyed in the making of a movie. <laughs> so, I always thought that was amazing that they actually did that, and then they just got. Have you seen Blues Brothers? Oh, I haven't seen it for decades. It was yeah. so gratuitous. I mean, they just. At one point, they just start throwing cop cars off of like pneumatic catapults into other right. cop cars. And then one cop car just what fell from a hundred feet. Well, and the, that was the Nazis. It's just those Nazi characters. Skokie, I hate, I hate Skokie Nazis or whatever. What, 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 I what, hate what? Illinois Nazis. Illinois yeah, it was Nazis, the Skokie. Yeah. yeah, the Skokie Illinois where they went through that Jewish neighborhood. But it was like um, there's that scene. I hate Illinois Nazis, and they drive the car and they all jump off that bridge. That's one of my favorite scenes in movie history. And then um, what I love is, like, because they piss off all those Nazis, like, for the rest of the movie, those guys are trying to chase them. And I think they, they're they both driving these Volkswagen station wagons. And so it's like it's like a red one and a green one. And, you know, they, they all have, like, these ridiculous titles, like, Yes, Group and Cure! You know? <laughs> so it's like, and then what I love is, like, these guys are driving along, and then, like, the one of them professes his love to the other one as they're dying because they drop it off a helicopter. And so in the movie, it's like he drives off a bridge and he can't land it, but when they actually film it, it's just it's over the top. They drop the car from, like, a lift helicopter, probably with a magnetic coupling. And, um, no, the, the bridge was maybe 30 feet, 40 feet. Yeah, that's, ground, <laughs> that's And amazing. the car clearly fell like, 100, 200 feet. 500, I thought. But like, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the funniest things in the world if you've got like any sense of, of perspective because it was so over the top. Yeah, I'm going to have to go watch that again. It's so good. Let me know what you think when you do. It's one of my favorite movies. I used to have... When I was in college, I had a copy of the Big Lebowski with the Blues Brothers preview, and a copy of the Blues Brothers with the Big Lebowski preview. And you know, just being having way too much time on my hands as an undergrad, I would watch the beginning of one, and I was like, "Oh, that looks like a good movie." And I'd start to watch the other one. I go back and forth. Get caught in an infinite loop. Yeah, it was maybe it was like a three, a four loop going to three, and then I would just be, "All right, I'm just gonna watch the Big Lebowski." <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, the, 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 this is this is the problem with, with with drinking while talking. I'm losing my uh, losing my my thread here. No problem. So, so you're talking about robotic servicer. That's right. And the uh, the the mobile base, which was you know GE GE Grumman was uh, had an articulated four wheel base that they were trying to push. This was, I think it was called the Samson project. Interesting. It was, in, it was for. Naval Carl, look ordinance. that up. What? I said, Carl, look that up. I, I, I looked it up. I can't find the reference to it anymore. Oh, never mind. But the, the Navy was sponsoring that task, but uh, it, it really never, for whatever reason, it never took off. But, you know, we, we got to look at how uh, Telemechanique and some other companies were making their robots for bomb diffusing, um, for, you know, shotguns. You take a shotgun with a blank cartridge, fill the barrel with water. Interesting. Put a condom over the end of it to keep <laughs> the water in the barrel. It's pretty funny. Aim it at the suspect package and fire. And that's just meant to dampen like a lower order explosive? The water just tears it apart and infiltrates everything and kills the circuit and kills the chance of it blowing up. I'm going to assume most time. Yeah, it doesn't... Eh. Well, I guess if it's by robot, even if it detonates, the worst thing that happens is you lose your robot. Yeah. But, no, the the, the Flight Teller Robotic, Robotic Servicer was a very odd contract. It was... Grumman was being paid by NASA to develop the specification for the robot, which we would then have to bid on meeting the spec that we had developed. 
So I should have rolled my and eyes there. <laughs> uh, North American, was it North American Rockwell was also competing? On your spec. What? On your specification. I, I know that they, they event, North American Rockwell eventually won the bid, but I don't know if they were also working on creating their very own specification. Interesting. But the, the point of this robot was something that was human sized. And so basically, it was androids in space. Bipedal? No, it was monopedal. Oh, interesting. It had a very large Schwanstorker. It's <laughs> funny. Uh, but it was the the pro, the pogo stick. Basically, the the leg was just a larger arm. Nice. Uh, looked like a looked like a baby's arm holding an apple. <laughs> it's a good Lenny no, Bruce reference. It really didn't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> baby's arm with an apple. On. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a force compliant tele operated robot. Cool. And so I helped. Uh, designed some of the actuators, although eventually we found a company, I think it was called, still, I think they still exist, called Robotics Research out of Cincinnati. Interesting. That made a seven degree of freedom robot arm. And I will I will send you links. It's a, it was an absolutely gorgeous looking arm. Yeah, it'd be cool to see. Using harmonic drives. Nice. And using uh, force sensors, strain gauge sensors on the output phase of the harmonic Series elastic? Arm. Okay, yeah, gotta be. So that they were the the output diaphragm was relatively stiff, but with a strain gauge, you can tell you you can determine small movements. But the original thought from the robotics research arm was it was a coordinate measurement machine. Wait, actually, that yes, it was a powered CMM. But with so, they did that with series elastic actuators. Yeah, because usually those things are not as accurate. Interesting. Well, the thing is, it would then calculate. The, def the deformation in the system to know the true position of the Renishaw probe that was at the end of it. That's pretty cool. Okay. And so we we found them and we adopted their system for our flight teller robotic servicer. So yeah. we had the the shoulder, it was roll pitch, roll pitch, roll all the way down the line to the to the hands. So uh it was uh Roll for the shoulder, then pitch, then roll, then pitch, then roll, then pitch, then a final roll was the seventh axis. And each axis was force compliant, force feedback. And these guys at Robotics Research, they would never give us the code. That's they annoying. They had it on a luggable, compact, C-O-M-P-A-Q. I remember computer. those that they would bring with them whenever we were doing testing. They would fly in to the airstrip at Grum and Beth Page in their little Cessna, and they'd carry their compact computer, plug it in between our comp our controller, which was uh, Schneider. They were, they were- Schneider under, Electric made controllers back then? Uh, they were under, for, those controllers we got were for control of underwater arms for the for Interesting. the submersible vehicles. Didn't know they did that. Yeah, they were we had six degree of freedom force feedback controllers that would through this software that we could never see control a seven degree of freedom arm. So wait, how do you control a seven left. degree of freedom arm with a six degree of freedom controller? Basically it would let you place the endpoint which would more than likely be a gripper. It would let you place the gripper. That's a degree of freedom the way you're defining it. Yeah. Okay, so any place it. in space in any orientation. And then, so once, you, once your gripper was set, you could then rotate the elbow. So you could avoid, if there was a bar here, cool. you could rotate your elbow out of the way of the bar. That's and awesome. there was a little uh, a push button switch on the hand grip and you could rotate the elbows independently, but then with your six degree of freedom controller, you could place the gripper wherever you wanted it. And the seventh degree of freedom was the elbow orientation. Interesting, okay, I didn't realize, that's interesting, okay. Yeah. And they had a, a fascinating, uh, they, they told us the general approach that their software used, 
which was they created a, vert a, a virtual broomstick in space. And they had a series a of springs, all virtual, between this broomstick and all the joints of the arm. And their arm would search for a minimal energy solution. Their software would search for a minimal energy solution. Like one of those magnetic algorithms where you sort of have like slopes and stuff? I, to be honest, I, ne I never took it further because- You've got joint space, I think is how they model that? Yeah, it, it had, it's seven degree of freedom joint space, but mm -hmm. at some point they modeled this broomstick and then that seventh degree of freedom control was placing the broomstick where you wanted your elbow pointing. That's interesting. But to, to make for very quick calculations instead of a full up inverse kinematic solution. Yeah, which they, I mean, I'm sure in those days was a nightmare. The energy. Still is. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and they work great. And we had a, a, a 3D uh, headset. We had uh, twin cameras to give us a, a 3D view. Nice. Uh, I had been reading Lenny Lipton. Is it Lenny Lipton? He was, he was, a, he was a hippie who probably had a copy of uh, the anarchist chapbook. <laughs> But he also got very much involved with 3D videography. Interesting. And wrote Let a book about it. And so our optics guy at Grumman was setting up a, a 3D video system because we wanted to have a stereo vision viewer for the person who was teleoperating the flight telerobotic servicer. And he came and since I you know chatted up chatted it up with him, he knew I was interested. And he said, uh, Steve, I'm having a hard time getting this to work. It's not working. Can you come by the robotics lab from the office down to the robotics lab and take a look at this and see what's wrong with it if you could? And I did. And the first thing I noticed was we had uh, circular the cameras were in circular housings. So, so like a cylinder. Mind, Hmm? Like a cylinder or a sphere? Like a cylinder. So okay. we'd have to put them in a V block and clamp them down. And my thought was, yeah, it does give you adjustability, but it also means that you're you're going to have a hard time getting them oriented properly because they're going to be a little bit out of adjustment. And there goes your 3D vision. Well, if there was play too, you would think it could follow the calibration really easily. Although, if the 3D vision is just for the perspective of a tall operator, that's a lot different than having to do trigonometry on it. Yeah, figure out but what eventually right the that. operator is 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 the end user. It's not going into math. It's going into a person's head. That makes sense. But I looked at it and I said, uh, "Did you maybe swap the left and right camera cables?" Interesting. And he goes, "He goes, I'm not stupid, Steve." <laughs> so guess what? They were swapped. They were swapped. So we swapped them back, and the 3D system worked great. <laughs> and then we had, uh, you know, I was talking with the programmers about. You know how you orient. What's your, what's your what's your uh, space your your state space uh, matrices? How are you oriented when you turn your handles? And they they wanted how do they want it? Whenever you turn that they they wanted when when you when you move your the arms the controllers the master controllers through space you want them to reflect onto the I don't know if we can still use master slave, the driver arms and the driven arms. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a bunch I, of different. I triple E has put the whole missiles. has put a, a warning out on that whole. Wait, have they out. really? Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. It's I mean, no that's no longer just... allowed. How long is male female going to be a thing? Do you think? I don't know. I I. We, we, you still allow, I think you're still allowed to say that. I think you are, but I don't know if you will be for man, much man, longer. I, I can see that. I can see the reasons for trying to get away from the whole master slave concept. For sure. No, I agree with you on that. So you have the control. But I also like. The so there's part of me that agrees, but there's part of me that's like, well, as an engineer, that's the terminology I know. But I don't mind learning new terminology, so right. it's like whatever. <laughs> so so yeah. you have the controllers yeah. and the controlled. Got you it. You have the controller arms and the controlled arms, and I said, your arms are on a mounted to a base, and that's your ground reference. And no matter Makes where sense. you turn your, your handles as you go through the six degrees of freedom. Your handles being the controller and the robot right. and on, the, on the ground being the controller. Grip, okay. You had a grip that you grabbed, and that was in a circular ring. And so you could go like this, and then you had gimbals and gimbals and arms and elbows. 
And so you have these very petite six degree of freedom controllers, and yay big or so, and you'd stick your hand in and then you could move them through their paces. You could click a button and reset, like you'd pick a mouse up off the table and reset the mouse Interesting. The all across the screen. You could do the same thing with the controllers. Cool. And I told the, the people who were managing the programming effort, I said, whatever base the controllers are mounted to needs to be your base reference for the arms that you are controlling with the controllers. Wait. And they said, no, we, we want it to move with the rotation. We want, it's like, you're going to drive your people insane if you constantly change your frame of reference. Your yeah, I could see that. Frame of reference. One of the best ones I actually saw was I, I had um, a couple of people from this company on the podcast, actually, but it's a company in Pittsburgh called RE Squared. And one of the things they originally did that got them a lot of money was they made bomb disarming robots, I think, for the Iraq war. And um, it was really clever because they had this kinematic chain and then they had a miniature version of that that was the controller. So it was all the same proportions. And they had, I think, potentiometers or encoders. I don't know because I've never looked inside it, but I've seen it demoed. Mm -hmm. And in the demos, you can see a miniature version of your robotic arm and you, you mess around with it as an operator. And then the controlled robot will mimic whatever movements you do with the controller. And so what you're describing to me reminds me a lot of that. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's very much like that. We had, I'm trying to remember both, maybe by the end of the, our, our talk, I'll remember the names of the companies that made the controllers too. But uh, fascinating work. And the ones we had were motorized. So they would push back. So if you moved the arms against an obstacle, the arm would recognize it had struck an obstacle because the arms had force feedback and they would sense the obstacle. So it would sort of push and then, back. And then your controller would fight you as you tried to move this remote arm through an obstacle. Cool. It was very cool. Yeah. Um, the problem is... It's really ahead of its time, by the way, if this was in the 80s, the early 80s, it sounds yeah. like. Well, the, the problem was uh propagation delays because the the flight telerobotic servicer was intended to be used by astronauts to help other astronauts assemble the space station well in that case you would so you're talking about latency from the control of the control that's the word yeah okay so uh, they either you would be on the shuttle and bouncing your signals off uh tdrs tdrss what's that which, uh, Tedris was a, geosync a geostationary satellite system. That Wait, so you, 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 you were going to Earth to control it? You, you, you would be in orbit around the Earth controlling uh, an FTS also in orbit around the Earth. What's an FTS? FTS, Flight Telerobotic Service. Got it, sorry. Flight Telerobotic uh, Service, I got it. But because you were never, the, the thought was you might not always have line of sight or direct radio communications between controller and you're controlled they would always default to bouncing the signal off this geosynchronous satellite system that... called Tedris. yeah that's and that would add huge latencies why the hell would you need an astronaut like if you're already going well i guess it would be earth it would be run, geosynchronous what's that you could also run it from earth yeah well that makes sense but if you're controlling it in space and the target is also in space like why would you need to control a thing on the other side of the Earth, or over here, if the Earth's curvature is here, and there's a little bit of a horizon over here, like, you would think, you know, I don't know, I mean, control it from where you're at, roughly, but I guess it's one of the things, robotic, and, so. Yeah, you and I talked about this uh, when we were setting up uh, this interview, is there's the, um, the OMV, uh, Orbiting Maneuverable Vehicle, that was also a project I worked on, and they cool. wanted a series of front end kits. And one of them that I worked on was a tumbling satellite retrieval kit. Oh, that's just cool. Later. Yeah, I want to hear about that. this unmanned space tug that is remotely piloted, and it's roughly disc shaped, but it's got a full, you know, think of something nominally the size of the descent module for the lunar lander. Okay, I know roughly the size of that, yeah. Uh, and so you would you would send it out and you'd remotely pilot it, and then you would mount a front-end kit 
to it. And that's say, you mean an end effector? Hmm? When, is a front end kit the same as an end effector, or is that something different? Well, the, the front end kit, it's like, um, it's whatever it is, it's whatever you want it to be. One of the big things we were looking at that, uh, looking for with that was a, uh, a method of retrieving tumbling satellites, a tumbling satellite retrieval. So it's a grabby thing. So it would be grabby, there would be an extender, then there'd be a turntable, then be grab, you know, a large articulated giant hand awesome that would just grab the satellite that's really cool and i'll send you a link i actually finally found after years of searching for it i found the paper that i uh co-wrote with one of the other engineers at grumman nice for the tumbling satellite retrieval kit for the omv one one of the front end kits we were developing included a large portion of the flight telerobotic servicer. So you stick the upper torso, arms, and head of a humanoid android at the end of a remotely piloted space tug, and you send it out in orbit to do whatever it's going to do. And at that point, you're pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be on the wrong side of the Earth from where you are. Yeah, that makes later. sense. Okay. So that's but yeah, you can also right. control the 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 FTS from ground. And now with all this talk of the gateway station in orbit around the moon that NASA's trying to get together. I haven't heard about this yet. I mean maybe I, I kind of live under a rock, but can you tell me about that for a minute or I, years ago, uh just a couple of years ago, I actually applied to JPL, I think it was JPL. Uh, down in Houston area because they were trying, they, they wanted to design robots to work on the Gateway Station. The Gateway Station is a smaller space station acting as a way station. W-A-Y, not W-E-I-G-H. A way station for lunar missions, like the Artemis program. And the Gateway Station would be in orbit around the moon. Cool. And most of its life, it would be empty. And you'd only fire it up when you needed to have astronauts go to the gateway station in preparation for landing on the moon or a place to go to once they ascended off of the moon's surface prior to then returning to Earth. So it's... they needed maintenance robots for the gateway station. That's awesome. And this was right up my alley. That really uh, seems like a NASA Ames function more than a JPL function, but maybe I'm missing the point. It, it could it could be that I'm remembering it wrong. It well, was. it also could be that JPL did that sort of thing too. Those guys always struck me as more academic, but eh, you know, I'm not I'm not a NASA insider, so I don't know. Yeah, but uh, it was it's the thing is the the FTS system that I was working on at Grumman eventually became Robonaut, and eventually oh, cool. launched onto the space station. That's awesome. And and the Robonaut imagery is is gorgeous and it worked very nicely. Yeah, but, it's a great looking machine. Crazy. But I don't think it, 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 it broke, unfortunately. They got a little bit of use out of it out of it on the space station. It it never really uh, met its potential. Yeah, I agree. It never really was used to its full potential. Back in the eighties when we were working on it, the thought was that it would be semi-autonomous. That's not because, what they ended up doing, I don't think. Yeah, e e even now it's not. It wasn't semi-autonomous. Even a couple of years back when they launched it, the thought was if you have these latency issues with a telerobotic control system, you need to find a way to make it somewhat autonomous. Makes the sense. Mars rovers, the uh, Perseverance, the Opportunity. Those robots have a, a decent level of or well, decent level of autonomy, because Mars is what is it six inch six minutes away? Light for some reason, I Earth thought Earth. twelve, but I, I would defer to you on this. I actually it, it depends you know. on if it's perihelion or aphelion. Either way, if it's on the same side or the opposite side of the sun from us. Yeah. But so the, the rovers have a lot of autonomy. They can navigate around obstacles on the Martian surface and you know you, you can they'll target a rock and they'll go after the rock and you don't have to be there 
you know, trying to control it with a joystick because with a six or a 12 minute delay, you cannot do it. And even with like, they, they tried various latency errors with the FTS and a vague recollection, even at 30 seconds, you could no longer control the robot very well. So they wanted to be able to point the robot at a bolt pattern, let's say, and tell the robot, I need you to loosen all those bolts and take the catch and take the hatch off and then ping me when you're done. Difficult for that many degrees of freedom of a system. Well, if, if but good in theory. It, 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 it shouldn't have been. The thing is, the degrees of freedom of the arms is taken care of by a, by a whole by a layer of control where if you just if you say listen I, here's my hatch here's its orientation here's the bolt pattern and so you can quickly calculate xyz coordinates and angular coordinates of all the bolts and then okay. you just send the end effector to those coordinates even with 80s tech you could do that fast and you can no. throw a computer at the way you can now no i mean what, what what's funny is it's, it's the same sort of 3D mapping that they wound up doing with Ka. It's very related to when they when they map the 3D, the 2D image onto the moving surface of the sand cliff deck cool. for Ka. They're pretty much doing the same sort of matrix math that they would have had to do to map the robot to undo the bolts on a, on a gen, uh, generically oriented hatch somewhere yeah makes sense that's a lot of matrices uh, it's not great linear algebra for being honest but yeah every so i mean for forward kinematics even you're, you're multiplying out a matrix i think for every joint yeah and but, then, but, in but addition to that is, you have to figure out every bolt and then you gotta researches their their mystery box would handle the inverse kinematics without doing inverse kinematics Right, they they had a they had a quick workaround that would do a quick anal a quicker analysis than inverse kinematics could be done at the time with the hardware available at that time. Yeah. But if you have one system that calculates the location of your bolts, sends that information bolt by bolt through the inverse kinematics chain, and then feeds the robot arm positions, then you've broken it down into workable pieces but yeah no I, I get that yeah the 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 software required back in the mid 80s like you're saying was just not up to it well and the harbor probably had difficulty crunching that many numbers that quickly i mean because even if you know where you are you know where you want to be now you've got to figure out all the places in between where you want to be at to get there and all that's a buttload of math i mean i don't know I, i'm not an expert on on this type of math really but I did enough of it in grad school that I have like a little bit of an idea of, of what it takes. Yeah. But uh, one of the other math issues we came across was with the, uh, the, the tumbling satellite retrieval kit for the OMV. Uh, the thought was that a satellite might not be tumbling around one of its principal axes. Or principal axes. I guess its principal axis might not be what you expected it to be. So like the Hubble Space Telescope, if, if you needed to acquire the Hubble Space Telescope and it had lost gyroscopic control and it was empty of all of its fuel stores, yeah. it would be tumbling somehow. Now it might be rotating about its long axis, but it might be rotating about another axis that might not be an orthogonal axis, so it might not be rotating as you would expect it to be rotating. So like a corkscrew sort of thing is a yeah, or, or, okay. or you know, just just pick a pick an axis in space and spin this thing around it. And if because Does it have to rotate about the center of gravity or can can it rotate offset? It, it'll to rotate around its center of gravity, but yeah. and, and again it's been a while since I did this math. The there's a I think the keep minimal energies because everything wants to seek a minimal energy condition the there's a there are axes that there are principal and secondary axes of, of inertia where if, if you if you do the math for this for for a, a 
just a, a randomly shaped object in space, it'll have an axis which it is more likely to spin around than any other possible axis. It's like a path of least resistance kind of yeah. thing. And I'm assuming it's got the least inertia around that axis, so spinning it will take up the least amount of energy, I think. Don't, don't start designing things based on what I'm saying. <laughs> Makes sense. But uh, my concern was we would take this tumbling satellite retrieval kit, which is a giant clasping claw, and go after something that you, first off, you'd have to figure out exactly what axis it was spinning around, because you then have to align your axis of rotation for the claw around the axis of rotation for the piece you're trying to capture. And you might not always get it right. And I, I told the project manager, I said, we, do, we as human beings in the, the mid-1980s do not have the technology with which we can calculate the interaction between two spinning objects in space whose axes of rotation are not perfectly aligned. Yeah. Because if I have the Hubble and this is the axis of rotation and the Hubble is oriented however it's oriented to that axis and I'm spinning my claw up around this axis, when they join up, it's like a universal joint for starters. And, yeah, it makes sense. And, and, and they, they're just going to mess very oddly. You're going to have relative motion. You're going to have impacts. You, I said, this is this is the problem that such a system would face, and we do not have the computational power yet to solve that problem, and we didn't. And in fact, years later, probably. So that was in the 80s, so probably in 2005 to 2010, when I was down in Maryland, uh, one of the uh, groups I hung out with, uh, of like-minded individuals, one of the guys was a NASA subcontractor working on the Tumbling Satellite Retrieval Project. Nice. The same exact project I had worked on some 20 or more 20, 30 years prior to him. And they still had not solved that issue. Not yeah. mathematically. They made smaller, they made like, you know, 10th scale models. So their little, their satellite was like this big and their, their TSR kit was like this big. And they brought them up in the Vomit Comet <laughs> to simulate zero G. Nice. And they, tried to have them grapple with each other and it was as one would expect a nightmare yeah but even even in the in the 2000 but the vomit comet i would think they would impact against the side of that <laughs> well they I, would need I, to have a I, lot of insulation foam. they release them once they're in free fall okay and that one and that the omv half of the system has little compressed air thrusters. Cool. But still it's it's a it's a nearly intractable problem. It makes sense. And uh, it was sobering to think that even 25 or 30 years later still couldn't be my solved. My prediction as to what the stumbling block was going to be is still the stumbling block. <laughs> Have we solved it yet at this point in like 2022 or is it still? I, I don't know that we, I don't know that we have. Yeah. I mean, one of the things is after, after the Hubble uh, was launched, NASA started to go to, I forget the name for it, but they started to equip most larger satellites with a common grappling interface. There were cool. a, or a handful of maybe three or four different styles of uh, universal interfaces. And so the thought was, A, if an astronaut, you know, either directly or indirectly through the use of the Canada arm or one of the large, larger Canada arms on the space station needed to grab a satellite, there were common uh, points on the satellite that they could grab. And that if the TSR ever became a reality, now the TSR would only have to accommodate a handful of possible 
So it's kind of similar, like a shunk zero point system for like a CNC machine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, I, I was I was all about the, the the quick disconnects for hands back then. Cool. I was just loving that and designing various tools. We got halfway into the the patent for one, but uh, but unfortunately, I wound up leaving Grumman for greener pastures at that point. Makes sense. But uh, yeah, and then when uh, when we were working on Ka, they uh, Cirque wanted a replaceable payloads at the end of a rotating interface. So I'm thinking, oh, it's a it's an end of arm tooling. It's a quick disconnect for a robotic wrist, but it has to be 10 feet in diameter and handle 100,000 pounds of payload <laughs> and spin at 3 RPM or whatever the heck it was doing. So I started to design it, realized that's insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having that disconnect, I mean, that's, that's a crazy constraint or requirement. Uh, yeah, you, you'd have to have so many interlocks and safety switches and the weight, the weight of the, of the, of the disconnect would have been prohibitively high, probably 50,000 pounds. I don't know. I never got that far with the design. That makes sense. I, but, uh, I've been dicking around with that stuff a little bit at work with the uh, the zero point systems for our CNC machines. But um, the, the zero point is is what exactly? So it, it's like a coupling between um, your pallet that contains your part and your machine, where there's tapered connectors that suck down into the machine in order to. Um, and I'll probably get this wrong because I haven't been working on it directly, but. The um, the idea is that you can maintain tolerance between um, your your moving platform and and your workpiece. So okay, so it's it's not the tool that you're connecting and disconnecting; it's the actual piece that you're working. That's on. right. Yeah. And okay. You call that a pallet, uh, the thing that holds the piece that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yeah, and then we've we've got kind of a cool system we're working on now to hold a bunch of them, so you know you can have the job for the next customer ready, and load it into your machine that way. And uh, yeah, doing doing some fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then, you but know, yeah, like still uh, using random shop probes you, a lot. <laughs> you're having track. a lot of fun in the Car Lane catalog, then I'm imagining. Car Lane, not not as such, not personally. Okay, because they they have a lot of fixtures. Uh, you know, fixture tools for that. I'll have to check that out. Um, how do you spell that? C A R R dash L A N E. Okay, easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'll check that out after this. Yeah. So they they have they have some I, some stuff they may build themselves. A lot of uh, a lot of things they have like a lot of the Staco equipment there. Yeah. For hold down clamps, and pneumatic or hydro, probably pneumatic uh, hold down clamps. But a lot of centering rigs, a lot of. That's awesome. You'll, you'll see. You'll there's see. there's a German company Schunk that we do a lot with, and then uh, there's another one that we were comparing against, whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, but there were some pros and cons of both systems. Yeah, no, I've I've seen some of the Schunk arms, actually the Schunk hands. Uh, one of our clients at Quick Pouch uses the Schunk a Schunk nice. hand to move their. Uh, their samples around one of my friends just got one of those for his brother's cnc machine and so he um set it up so he's got basically an array of parts and he can grab one with a shunk hand and load it into the machine and so it's, it's i don't know it's fun to figure out this kind of automation and see it yeah, yeah. No, what was it when i was at uh anorad we had a system that loaded uh, we, we took little computer dies around probably less than 10, yeah, probably around five or seven millimeters on a side, uh, with 90 little raised gold bumps. And we had to align it precisely with an etched, uh, nickel, uh, a slide around this big, wow. uh, etched nickel fingers that had to align precisely to within half a within five ten thousandths of an inch wow. or okay. and, and these are contacts to make electrical right function? so okay. we, we would take the tiny little spacing and we'd spread it out through this etched nickel component 
uh, but we had to be able to load those slides. Uh, and so we, we basically got a, um, oh, who, who's a, a, a little SCARA style arm. I can't remember the name of the company. Uh, would have been an IBM then. I know they had an interest uh, in SCARA yeah, back not, in the day. Not, not a Unimate. It was a smaller one. It was only yeah. about, you know. Cool. Uh, probably on two, three feet tall. That is a small uh, one. And just bolted it to the side, bolted it to the floor next to our unit, and it would do the manual loading and unloading of uh, of that stuff. And then our unit would take care of, you know, local uh, part manipulation. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That was a lot of fun. Now, and then, that was Anna Rad, and they got bought out by Alan Bradley, I believe. That's a good buyout. <laughs> to... Yeah. Especially if you had the stock options. But, uh, yeah, so what else did I work on at, uh, you know, we had uh, Grumman was starting to experiment with digital servos for one of their robot arms. Interesting. And, oh, it wasn't Telemechanique. I forget the, there was, there was an arm that was designed for Oak Ridge National Laboratories originally. It was, it was driven by steel bands, not quite cable driven, but thin steel bands would drive it. And all the motors were in the back of the shoulder. Oh. So as the arm would extend and retract, the whole system of motors for all the different degrees of freedom would rotate to provide an optimum counterweight experience for that arm. That's interesting. And... It had a, a, a simple single degree, a, a, a single axis gripper, but it could rotate. It had a differential mechanism of sorts at the end. So this thing going on with the miter gears. Right, so the, 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 the claw could go up and down and rotate yeah. and then open and close. And yeah, again, cool. o Oak Ridge National Labs, it was originally meant to help people out to, to manipulate radioactive payloads. And it had its own miniaturized version of itself as the controller and then this larger arm with a six or seven foot reach was the controlled arm and Grumman was trying out digital encoders for the very first time when would this have been because that again mid to late 80s okay because that's technology I've known my whole career but I was born right. in 88 we're, we're, so. we're used to Incremental encoders and absolute encoders, but they are they are digital encoders. They're not yeah. potentiometers and they're not resolvers. That's they right. They are digital encoders and they require a different approach to the how it's you totally calculate different. the stability of the control system. It makes sense. Uh, and so I walked, I happened to be walking by the lab one night, and the electrical engineer who was running that project was just starting to work the arms with the very first attempt at digital encoders. And he moved the arm slowly and it was fine. And he moved it a little faster, it was fine. And then he did a very rapid back and forth motion with the master controller. Lost and this, the controlled arm went unstable. Ah, brutal. It started swinging back and forth Men, the, the elbow was high and the arm was low. It started swinging back and forth very, very menacingly. And in fact, if it had contacted with his head, it would have knocked him out cold and possibly caused serious damage. The problem was the e-stop button was on the other side of the arm Me. from where he was. Brutal. He had to crawl underneath the swinging arm to hit the e-stop <laughs> And I, I just happened to be walking by the open door, you know, sort of after hours. And I, you know, I learned a few good lessons, which is always have an e-stop button near you. It's not a lot of money. <laughs> and, and, and never run experiments alone. Yeah, brilliant. Actually, that's I, I admire yeah, that, that, that to extrapolate was, this kind of lessons. Swinging wildly, and then this is weird. I, 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 I can't remember this directly anymore. I can only remember this indirectly. At one point, some of the bands jumped off 
some of the pulleys for this during the car. same exact incident. It might have been due to that. And for some reason, either my bosses were convinced that I knew how to fix it, or I foolishly convinced them that I knew how to fix it. And <laughs> I got I got to fix it. And I fixed it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but that was that was a very complicated piece because all the motors were remote. All the con motors well, and controls were so many of those robotic remote, arms are like that because control. I guess they don't want to inertia at the tip. And so all the actuators are located at the base. And the it, linkages. I also thought it might have had to do with radiation issues. Interesting. To, to keep, you know, at, at some point, if if you're using your robot in a hot environment. This was for Nuke. Then okay. you, 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 obviously the parts that get radiated, you get to throw away. And so the, if, if, if this is the arm. Yeah. Right mid, you know, so here's, here's the, here's the wrist and here's the elbow and here's the shoulder. Yeah. And right around here is where you pass through the radiation shielding. Yeah. And you had a big bellows from the wall to the, to the bicep, just oh, side of the elbow. And so you want to keep everything outside of the room if you could. Yeah, and then that gets dumped in a spent fuel pool and nobody ever sees it again. Right. So, so but that was that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. That's hilarious about that dude working on that. Yeah, he I I remember him crawling underneath the wildly swinging arm. The fact that he had to do that to access an emergency stop is terrible. Yeah, yeah, he he hadn't been thinking. Is he the one that designed that system? No, no, the, the arms themselves were designed by another company. What I meant is integrated the emergency stops. I that I can't that I don't remember. Okay, I, I would I would think that the arms came with an e stop. Yeah, I had one co worker when I was at Joy Global who I don't get along with now for reasons I won't go into. But um, what I did like about him is that he always insisted on having an emergency stop within arm's reach whenever he was working with these. Uh, there were miniatures of our mining vehicles. So we had these four-story high mining vehicles. We would build uh, just massive machines. And um, one thing I liked that the advanced automation group where I worked did is that we would build, you know, maybe like one sixth or one twelfth scale models of these vehicles in order to refine the sensor systems and the autonomy on the vehicles. We'd get it working on that, and then we'd build the kit into a Pelican case. And some dick in engineering would take this out into the field and install it on the full scale vehicle. We would beg a customer, let us do this with the vehicle because we didn't have a whole lot of them. And, um, this one guy uh, whose name I won't repeat, again, because of reasons I won't go into, um, insisted every time he was testing this, because I mean, it was basically a robot arm that could punch you in the gut <laughs> to a lot of damage, even at that one sixth to one twelfth scale, because we're talking a four story vehicle at full scale. Um, he was always, you know, I gotta have an e stop because that kid thing couldn't reach out and get me. You know? So I thought that was wise. No, that was very, very wise of him. Yeah. For whatever other reasons you might not have liked him, that was that was a good, uh, wise approach on his part. Thanks. Yeah. No, I I, I worked at a company where their um, their e stops were normally open circuits. Normally, an e stop normally be closed. A, a normally closed circuit. Because if you chop the wire, it should shut it off. Right. Or if you forget to plug it in also shut it off then your machine won't start and i had a i had a fight with the people at this company i will not name the company uh to give my systems a normally closed circuit for the e-stop circuit and they did not understand why and then we got uh, a small little pick and place robot arm in from adept adept was the name of the company yeah i remember those guys sold us the arm and uh, the very first day we got the adept arm in, we uncrated it, and I looked on the back of the uh, where all the connector panel was for the adept arm, and there was one connector installed, and it had a little wire loop running. 
from, you know, pin five to pin seven or whatever the heck it was. And I went to my boss and I said, come here, look at that connector. I said, I haven't even looked at the instruction manual for this thing, but I will tell you right now that connector is dummying up the e-stop circuit so you can plug the robot in and fire it up right out of the box. Single channel. Interesting. And and it was. They put in a closed circuit so that you could fire this thing up. I yeah. said the I said the entire industry, automation controls whatever normally closed circuit. As you when should. You hit the red button, it opens the circuit. Even alarm systems use that. I mean, and that's much less critical. Yeah. So and I'm with yeah, you on that we, one. We we made that change. I dragged them kicking and screaming into the twentieth century. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm looking at a machine that's behind this monitor that uses double channel closed circuit, mm -hmm. normally closed e stops, I should say. Yeah. And yeah, it's. No, I, I, I learned that they had their e stops wired that way when they gave me a little test rig to, to try out some of my uh, sequence operations on this little test rig. And it wasn't working right. It was about to, you know, impale itself on something. So I hit the e stop button. And nothing changed. The system kept wasn't running. connected. It wasn't even connected. It wasn't even plugged in, which is my fault for not plugging it in. However, you However, shouldn't have been allowed to do that. Been part of the design. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. I mean, I, I, it's one of those things where I think a layperson listening to this might think, you know, what kind of an OCD person cares about that, but. <laughs> I mean, to, to those listening, if you do it the way that Steve is describing and you have it open, I mean, well, yeah, it's exactly what you just said. Like, you could have it unplugged and it's not going to do anything. Or if you do it the other way, if you unplug it, it just will not start up. It's it's e-stopped already by being unplugged. And so it's it's idiot-proof, which is important when somebody might be hungover, um, drinking whiskey here, somebody might be hungover or having a bad day or any number of things, maybe just they're an idiot. I mean, anything could screw that up. Yeah. And so, I mean, you want to make things foolproof so people don't get injured or killed. The, the thing is, with, with the theater work that I've done, it was never an issue. It was never a question. E-stops, wherever you might have a need for them, line of sight to see what was going on. And every E-stop was a normally closed circuit. And if you hit any one of them, your system would shut down. And Good. then I don't know that I doubt it that, that that theater and entertainment drove this system, but there are now classes of e stop. And some and so some e stops will just pull power, others will slow you down yep. and then enter a safe state. Others will slow you down, stop you, and then drop power. Straight but break. In 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 theater we would have some pieces that were very tall. And if you hit an e-stop and just pulled power and slammed on the brakes, your tower would topple, Yeah, which is not a very safe system. Makes sense. So you, you had this halfway e-stop, which now has been, uh, you know, immortalized as a class zero or class one e-stop. I've had, you know, I've had a glass of wine, so. Some people will have to forgive me for not memorizing all the different classes of e-stops. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that would that would slow you first and then stop you. Yeah, that makes sense. So well, and that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, even a braking condition is different than a drift condition, and which one you want to pick depends on your application. Yeah. So so you're allowed to you're allowed to have that discussion to keep your system safe. I'm, I'm working with a friend, uh, another engineer, mechanical engineer I've known for probably over 20 years. And he has a, a winch or a hoist for the entertainment business that has uh, built-in fail-safes on the e-stops. It has some circuits that are provided by a company that makes wonderful fail-safe brakes. So if you hit the e-stop, it feathers the brake to give you a controlled stop but after a certain period of time it just puts the brakes on full force 
Yeah, so that it, makes it sense. It gives you a chance to decelerate in a controlled manner. But in case that controlling little bit of circuitry fails, fail, it has another part and it's all, you know, SIL rated. It's all European safety code rated. So it gives you a couple, you know, a, a portion of a second to do a controlled stop. And then it says, if you're not stopped by now, you're stopping now. And it just fully pulls all power from the brakes, lets the fields collapse, let the brakes engage, and that's stop awesome. you dead in your tracks. But We're looking at a Siemens safety PLC for something I'm doing at work right now, which is, um, I feel like similar to that. I mean, there's a bunch of different rules and we're systems engineering the whole thing. And yeah, it's, it's terrifying, but also makes sense given what we're trying to do. Looking at classes of e-stop. My philosophy is always you want it to be simpler rather than not. So the moment you get a PLC involved, you introduce complexity. But at the same time, what you said holds true. You know, if you don't give it a chance to be intelligent to some extent, then you might have a really unsafe condition. So yeah. I don't know, it's an interesting. Yeah. So this is class subject. zero, one, and two. Class zero is uncontrolled stop by immediately removing power to the actuators. Class one is a controlled Drift. stop with power to the machine actuators available to achieve the stop. Then you remove the power. And Great class, thing, but... that's class one and class two is a controlled stop with power left available to the actuators interesting so class two relies on the controls the more than strangers yeah i mean you would think i mean so there was something one of my somebody I used to work with would say that kind of stuck with me i don't know I mean, there's different schools of thought on this, obviously, but what this guy said is there is no safety in silicon. And so what that meant was if you're relying on a control system, it's not really safe because that control system can fail. Yeah. So I don't know. So you've got to be able, you've got to be able to pull power somehow. Yeah. I've always wanted to rely on simple circuitry for stuff like that, but I mean, it's tricky because, like you said, there's always going to be an edge case or an extenuating circumstance or, you know, maybe you've got a dynamic system where if you just cut power, it becomes unstable. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, that's that's where they pay us engineers the big bucks. <laughs> we, Absolutely. We go and we figure that out for them, for people. Yeah, you say you've had a glass of wine. I've had about three or four whiskeys. So. I see. I see. I I. I I know my limits. Yeah. I think I know mine too, but I also realize, you know, I'm not going to be as sharp right now as I would be if I hadn't had three or four whiskeys. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah, know, I'm, I, I acknowledge that I am a, a, a lightweight. Yeah. I am a One of my coworkers, by the way, was watching my podcast and she gave me an advice on a liver supplement. <laughs> <laughs> She was like, you might want to consider this. <laughs> that was a little funny. bit of a de detoxifying uh, elixir there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, let's see, what else? What else? Uh, trying to make it a Grumman centric. Uh, yeah, this has been interesting. So we talked about works. catching spinning satellites. We talked about the precursor to the Robonaut, which was a teleoperated system with a third leg. Yeah. Then, oh, the other the other amusing thing about the Robonaut is, well, first off, I, you know, everybody but me was thinking, you know, it should be humanoid. And I'm thinking, are we going to really bring it in the space station? Does it really need to be humanoid? And are there better configurations that both can handle the tools and the tool storage better, can handle the arms and the stabilizing leg better, can handle thermal management, which is a pain in the ass in space better. <laughs> and sense. I think I still have the image and I'll shoot it over to you with a collection of images sure. um, of a hexagonal body with the head and the arms at one end of the hexagonal prism. Interesting. So that it can focus its efforts on the thing and all the other nonsense is, is playing out behind it. Is that the compute, the locomotion or both? The it's 
it was never thought to be battery powered. So it was never power. It could be power management. Okay. But it's primarily storing the computers the for the analysis uh, and the servo control, as well as storing the drives. And the motors would be in the arms. The motors were at each joint. Cool. And the encoders were at each joint. Cool. And you had either slip rings or service loops as appropriate. Nice. Makes sense. Uh, but the electronics, and you had your, your strain gauges, obviously, at each joint. Still series elastic. Hmm? Still series elastic if you're using yeah. strain gauges. And, uh, but the, the, when, you, when you see the arms, they're absolutely gorgeous. And I'm hoping that there are some videos that we can link to. Yeah, I would like that. But I mean, one of the things that they did in the test lab was you could define a line for the arm to for the end effector to move along and then it was like it was like putting a 3d ruler up in space cool. and so you you define the line so if you had like a a shower ring on a shower curtain rod because that's one of the tests they did you just move the hand controller roughly and the robot will take that ring and move it along a predefined course, which is when it's at its easiest, is a straight line, but a straight line in three-dimensional space. So a little bit of an X, delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Makes sense. And it, it looked absolutely gorgeous. And then we had And to perpetuate it, that among, you know, like seven degrees of freedom, or I think it was seven off, what you were describing. Yeah. I mean that takes some work, you know. So that's that's yeah. beautiful. And and then you also had you had a, a left arm and a right arm, each with seven degrees of freedom. You had a torso, and the waist was three degrees of freedom. So you had a total of seventeen degrees of freedom. <laughs> and if you and because it used that energy minimization method, if you went and reached out with one hand and you went beyond the capacity of just the arm with the shoulder in a fixed position, it would then manipulate the waist actuators and it would continue moving in a straight line. That's awesome. As the hand moved forward and all the actuators would in essence seek this lowest energy solution given these virtual springs to a virtual broomstick. And the software you were never allowed to see, but seemed to have worked. That's cool. Yeah, it was, it was gorgeous. You got gorgeous, smooth moves for that. But I- You can see that, why they didn't want to show you how that worked. Yeah, that may have, I'm thinking, yeah, that was Grumman, that was early on. That was my introduction to force compliant control, which I then used in at Anorad for that die, when we when we had to bond the die to its surrounding substrate, we use a force compliant control system there, which I did not know how to write the code for that, but I knew what I wanted, and I talked to the electrical and servo engineers at Anorad, and they implemented it, and it made the project successful. Nice. And, and then when it came to Ka, the main the the two main hydraulic axes of the sand cliff deck, which is the tilt axis and the lift axis, those two axes are force compliant controlled. And they're force compliant controlled because I knew we needed to do that in part because of my work with the flight tail robotic servicer in the mid eighties. That's awesome. Grumman Aerospace. That's really cool. At the risk of sounding Obtuse, force compliant controlled is not series elastic. That's force compliant controlled. That's but basically you, you add force feedback or is it series elastic? So you know where it's at and you get it right there based on strain gauge. I'm sorry. They're, 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 they're very much related, except with the with force compliant control, you typically, your spring is still a very stiff spring. And you just have a very sensitive strain gauge associated with that spring, whatever that spring is. Okay. Uh, and it tells you the force that you're creating along that axis. That makes sense. Yeah. One of the one of the, the simplest way to look at it is, you know, most everybody is familiar with uh, cruise control on a car. 
you set your car to go at 55 miles an hour and you press the button and the car goes at 55 miles an hour. Now, if some idiot pulls in front of you and starts going 45 miles an hour, you will slam into him. Yeah, they with traditional it. crews, not with adaptive crews. What but talking about? With, with the newer cars, they have adaptive cruise control. So if somebody pulls in front of you and starts going 45 miles an hour, your car, if it's equipped with adaptive cruise control, will modify its speed. It will change its speed to 45 miles an hour and maintain a certain preset distance between you and the car in front of you. Makes sense. When that car pulls away, leaves your lane, your vehicle will now return to the speed it's been set for, 55 miles an hour, whatever it happens to be. That is probably the, 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 uh, one of the easiest analogs or analogies to force compliant control. Another thing is if you have a, uh, a robotic arm and you want it to swing four feet to the left, only at the three foot mark, there is a wall hopefully with a bit of cushioning, but there's a wall at the, at the three foot mark. With a force compliant system, the arm will hit that wall and sense a huge increase in force. Yeah. And that force is fed back into the, the what's called the summation node of the servo control system. The summation node is where you compare your goal with where you are at. Cool. So if you have a goal of four feet, and you're at three feet, your summation node says, I still have a foot to go. If you take your force information and scale it appropriately, and that that's the trick. That's, again, where people make the big bucks is knowing how to scale that. So if, you, if your arm at three feet hits a wall and starts developing a lot of force as it tries to move through that wall, that force is scaled so it's uh, equivalent to that distance. And yeah. There's your scale factor. You've got to work that out. So and now you are pushing, okay. and it's getting this additional information going back to the summation node, which says, I'm seeing 50 pounds of force. Let's call that the extra foot. And <laughs> so it says, you know what? I'm at target. I'm going to stop pushing. And that, in a very simple form, is force compliant control. Okay, if the wall thank goes you. away, your arm will now continue. If the wall goes away and that 50 pounds drops to zero, the arm says, Let's go over there now. I'm only at three feet. I've got another foot to go. And it goes for that additional foot. If that makes sense. 20, if the force drops to 25 pounds, that's only equivalent to a half a foot displacement, let's say. So now the, the arm keeps pushing because it only sees 25 pounds because it's it thinks it still has a ways to go as it pushes more the force it gets back to 50 and then it's there exactly okay that so makes that, sense. That, that's a, a lay person's if, if, if this good is like, for my plebeian ass <laughs> you know what we should do you you've seen drunk history right yeah we should do a drunk engineer i mean i think we're doing it <laughs> But uh, we would have to get, I mean, to equal drunk history, those people get so drunk, it's ridiculous. And so yeah, it's, 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 it's dangerous. We would have to drink like five times what we drank. Yeah. And then we and would then be at that to, level. And then your, your editor would hate you because you'd have to have cutaways <laughs> to people dressed as Alfred, I, you know, Albert Einstein and, uh, <laughs> and Newton, yeah. you know, lip syncing to our drunken Alan Turing. <laughs> That would be hilarious. I don't know. Maybe we can work. That would be very that. expensive to produce, but I, I, yeah. I think we've got something here. This might be the new uh, concept. If collaborative with Spencer Krauss flops, which it will, <laughs> the next concept is drunk engineering, yeah. which is basically the same thing, but with a bigger budget for, for like, post. Yeah. So, now I like Parker that. Parker Posey, or whatever her name is. Audrey, Audrey uh, what, what's her name? Uh... Hepburn? <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, Audrey too. Uh, no. <laughs> Audrey the Great. Or, or, Aubrey, Aubrey Plaza. Okay, I don't know that person. 
Yeah, she, she's she's a, a very unique actress. But uh, the last three or four drunk histories I've seen, she's a re she's a regular. <laughs> That's awesome. I think one of my favorite comedians, Mark Normand, was on there, and apparently they couldn't use this episode because it was just too much of a train wreck. <laughs> Uh, we, we after I watched, uh, or, or rather, I was listening to Hamilton, the yeah, musical. Yeah, no, Hamilton's great. I saw that live. Oh, it's amazing. And yeah. they had Lin Manuel Miranda on yeah. Drunk History talking <laughs> about Hamilton. That's cool. That's like, it got you. My daughter and I watched that, and it was just so hilarious because the guy, the guy knows his. For sure, you would have to given that role. Yeah, that's awesome. I gotta, I gotta watch that now. You gotta send me that link. <laughs> but... All right, I should, I should be, I should be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I, what I need to send you? It's gonna be a laundry list. I mean, you and I always do this. You know, it's. I admire this because usually I, you know, I, I kind of, I just want to be consistent with the release schedule and. I don't edit in as many clips of the work, but when you do this, you kind of hold me to it, and it's good because I, the edit, the episodes that you come on are, are so well produced, and mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I, 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 I'm always, I've always been a huge fan of multimedia. Yeah, I think it's more engaging. Uh, when I rewatch the episodes that you're on, it's yeah, it's compelling. I mean, I, yeah, and then you do a good job promoting it too because you tell your friends, so it's great. Appreciate that. Did, 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 did I do as much promoting this time around? I don't know. I don't know that this one got as many hits, but I mean, whatever. Like, it's it's fun making these. I enjoy having these conversations. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a way to have a drink with a friend and talk about interesting stuff in engineering, yeah. which, I mean, I don't know. We've all nerded out over and, you know, I mean, we're participants in it now, but it's interesting to hear other people's stories. I don't know. I, I just have fun making these. So. Yeah, yeah. So my my, uh, my my son got a call. I, I can't say what production company, but um, they want him to be in a a vampire band in some movie or <laughs> series based so, off of Night Teeth. Uh, it it might have been derived from Night Teeth. It might have just been, you know, him him talking it up or the, the you know he Eggsy hooked it up. He's he's hooked up with this uh, Caballero casting out in New Orleans. Nice, and they handle a lot of background uh, actors. I'm, I'm assuming typically not SAG actors. Makes sense. Uh, and and Greg is concerned. He goes, you know, I, I to get a SAG card is three thousand dollars, and it also means that you can't do as much background work. Makes sense. But, but when you do the foreground work, you can get a much better pay rate for it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, apparently, he they they are they are asking for him now. Very cool. Which is very cool. Very good for cool him. Indeed. I'm glad. And he, uh, I don't know if he gets to lead the band or if he's just a member of the band. I don't know if it's going to lead to him him having a spoken word or two. We shall we shall see. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations. That's great. Yeah. I, he said, "I don't know, Dad, if I can do it because you know if I'm it's it, they're, they're shooting at night and I'm doing the arborist, the tree climbing work during the day. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to be exhausted." And I told him, "Well, you know which one I prefer you do." Yeah. The, the 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 risk of him falling a hundred feet while you know in a vampire band is really minimal. Plus, I mean, you're an entertainment guy, so I feel like that's, you know, you've yeah, got to be proud of the dude for doing that. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Can, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be ready by the time this episode airs on Sunday, but it would be interesting to see that when it comes out. I'd be curious to, to check oh, out. You, 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 you know me. I'm going to post links to whatever he's in. The moment it comes out on Facebook, on LinkedIn, send out emails. Let me know. I mean, I would but love you, to see it. Have you seen Night Teeth yet? I have not. I feel ashamed of myself. I know I should watch it. Um, I've just been burning the oil at, at Forum Logic, and yeah, every time I watch a movie, I feel like it's kind of a commitment. So I just don't watch a whole lot of movies. I think I've watched maybe like one movie between the last time you and I talked, and it wasn't Night yeah. Teeth. Oh my god! We're well, one, of the, one of my friends at work. I know I was talking about Greg and Night Teeth, and he he went and watched it that night. He's got a 4K TV. Nice. 
And I, I told him, I said, this is how you'll recognize it as, as Greg. He's in a sports jacket, but the sleeves are drawn up to his elbows. <laughs> because of his he has some massive tattoos on his arms. And I think they want to show the tattoos. I said, I How do you a- do that with a sports coat, though? Like, that's. I, I, you know, I can't even do it. I mean, my forms are very big, but like. You no, know, the, the people <laughs> in costuming aren't going to be designing force compliant servos, and I'm not going to be figuring out how to get the sleeves of a sports coat rolled up to the elbows. I'll leave <laughs> that to the expert. But uh, in 4K, you could see the, tat- the tattoos. Cool. And you could see his big ear gauges. In 1080p, it's just sort of lost in the. In the Which static. is what I'm running because I'm a pleb. Hmm? I'm running 1080 because I'm a plebeian. I said. <laughs> I know 1080 1080p here too. I finally got my my stereo. Uh, I have a 3D TV. Finally got that hooked up, and I found the glasses. They were lost in the move. I should check those because I have a 3D TV too, and I have no idea where the glasses are. So I should probably find those. If they're passive, even the 3D glasses from the movie theaters will work. Nice. It's a passive system. I think it's a it's one of the ones where they're polarized at 90 degrees, yep. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, then, then you're good. If they're active, you're screwed. They're 60 to 80 bucks a pair. That's not so bad. But, I mean, it just seemed like a gimmick. I never really ran it. And so I... I... We, we watched Life of Pi. That is one of the... Can you get 3D Netflix? videos on Netflix? Um, I don't know if Netflix does it. I know Roku has a 3D channel. Cool. I don't. I, I. I'm trying. I think it works okay, but the the. I bought my 3D I'm setup. I'm an used. Apple TV, but I also have a Roku. So yeah, I, I bought my TV used, and the guy gave me a box of glasses. There's over ten 3D glasses. They're more glasses than I could ever fit people in front of the set, and there are tiny. I'll get you a good people. deal. I'll Venmo you some money if you send me a pair. <laughs> There are tiny little glasses in there for infants. I swear to God, the glasses are for someone with a head that's no more than four inches wide. They have straps, so you can strap it to your infant's head. It's like clockwork so orange. Watch a three D TV show. It's like this seems like child abuse to me. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> let them play, dig a hole, as George Carlin said. <laughs> yeah, we must hit your friend with a stick. Do something. <laughs> Poking dead guy. Yeah. <laughs> Live your life. All right. I think we're hitting a good stopping I point. Good. I think we're good here, Spencer. <laughs> Diminishing returns, Steve. Uh, so, anything you want to plug? Anything uh, we did Night Teeth last time? Uh, night, Night Teeth, and still waiting to hear production news on uh, In with the Devil. Nice. In with the Devil, uh, Night Teeth. Uh, he's in. He's in. I can't. I haven't even. Do you get TNT? I do not. I mean, I, I do Hulu, Netflix, Prime Video, HBO Max. Those are my my TV yeah. channels. Well, he, he's in he's in he's in a nightclub scene again in Claws, episode season four, episode four. That's TNT. I think it's TNT. None of us none what? of us get it. Is none that one of the streaming networks, or is it like strictly cable? Uh, no, it's 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 regular cable. I don't have that crap. I mean, I'm not proud of it. I just, unfortunately, Missy I do not. Nash, because uh, she's in Claws. Uh, it is on TNT, and I don't get TNT anymore. Yeah, so I, just... I can't even watch my son in his in his latest release. <laughs> Brutal. He, he's he's background. He's background. Yeah, well, that's uh. There's got to be a way to pirate that, or you know, watch it at a friend's place, or. Yeah, uh, get it from if, him. If I if I knew someone with cable, who could give me their login information, my parents might have I it. I could I could piggyback onto TNT through the Roku. I think. I think that's. The, I mean, I get HBO because my parents just gave me theirs. I gave them my Hulu, and then I think we all use my brother's Netflix. Yeah, because when, <laughs> when my when my dad had Verizon cable, he got HBO. And not that he ever watched it, but he got HBO. I had Optimum, but I could log into HBO through my Roku by, in essence, spoofing my dad's Verizon login. Nice. 
But my dad and I spent about four hundred dollars in the nineties to uh, steal satellite, and I remember we uh, we worked very hard on it. There was a Unix machine uh, that it was like twenty bucks the computer show, and we had a um, seri- like a DB nine serial card reader. And then we had this card that was like $400 on eBay because it was still reprogrammable called an H card. And then there was an emulator that you had to put that in the box. It was a PCB with contacts on it that would get triggered by the serial interface by that Unix machine. And then the Unix machine would sit in between that and the card that you'd reprogram and it got all the channels. And we, we spent all this time on it. It was me and my kid best friend and my dad and I think his dad too, who was an engineer, and the four of us got it running. And uh, my mom made us take it down the next day because she's a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> so... <laughs> no, we got my, one day uh, out of it. No, my 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 ex saw we we watched a little bit of the last interview with you and I had, and she goes, "Oh, you 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 can't be saying some of those things. Someone's going to hear this. You're going to get in a lot of trouble." Which <laughs> oh, I, I I forget. Oh, I, I it might have been when I was complaining about the guy who signed off on the vertical axis wind turbines. Oh, that's when you told me to take out that word. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, was, let's not mention that now. But yeah, yeah. I, I was rather disparaging towards him. We think we just beeped it. You know, so yeah, there's I, a word that's uh, beeped. I mean, I won't say what. Well, oh, because you because people are going to watch this. And I'm thinking, we hope. <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. I don't think it's that embarrassing to be a human. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I try not to talk too much smack. You know, I try to be some, some, friendly, some professional. People, it it rolls, off their, rolls off their back like water from a duck, and other people just will take a grudge. If you get mad at me for anything I've said on here, fire all complaints to podcast and SK solutions. No, I, I I was year, years ago. I was on a uh, a website just just to, you know friends getting together, and I made a joke. It wasn't even a dirty joke. It was just probably not entirely safe for work, and it was a little. It it, it wasn't politically incorrect. I wasn't going to get canceled, but I made the joke. Some woman took offense to it. Talked to her friend. Her friend talked to her husband, and the husband decided he was going to teach me a lesson and called me up and called my wife up at the time and was verbally abusive towards me. Uh, I'm sorry about that. That's brutal. So so there are there there are people out there who who got nothing better to do with it. Yeah, I mean, if you're unemployed or you're a little bit too controlling or you know, maybe you're just bored. It's unfortunate yeah. that people act that way. So, but I said, yeah, I still don't want to hold back too much of them. Where's the fun in that, right? Well, thanks for having the stones to come on. I mean, I, I really do enjoy making these things and it's fun just to, I don't know, just to act like a normal human. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're good. I started watching some of your others and uh, I got to put the time aside so I can do that more. I gotta watch Night Teeth. I, I feel thoroughly ashamed because I do have a Netflix subscription, so I have no excuse. Maybe that'll be my night before I go to bed, and then wake up at six forty-five a.m. tomorrow. Go go to the fifty-minute mark and watch it for twenty minutes, and you—that's you, all. Fifty that's, minutes for twenty minutes, easy. Yeah, at, at the fifty-minute mark for twenty minutes, and you'll see him. Once the whole once movie there, looks good though. Like I actually do want to watch it because it, it is it is enjoyable. I like the trailer. Like I did watch that, and so I do I do want to see the whole thing. So yeah, maybe I'll just I, watch I won't it. Tell you not to. It's, 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 it was fun. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button, or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening, and please come to the next one.